My nose is red. Oh, it looks. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special episode of Bad for Your Health Entertainment. I'm Tom, and tonight I am joined by the legendary Amanda Kruger herself from uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5, Miss Beatrice Bopley. How are you tonight, Beatrice? I'm doing great, thank you. How are you, Tom? Not bad, not bad. I appreciate you coming on and talking a little bit of your career, Nightmare 5, Quarantine. She was the lead in Canadian films such as Quarantine and Matinee, appeared on television with one Mr. Johnny Depp, worked alongside the late Sidney Poitier in Shoot to Kill. You didn't have a scene with Tom Berenger, I don't recall. It's been yeah, a, it's... I don't have a scene, well, yeah, no, Tom wasn't, I mean, he. I, I, met, I did meet him. But the scene wasn't with him. Yeah, yeah. the scene was with Sydney in the yeah. cemetery. For, forgive right me now. for getting off topic in my yeah. intro. But most notably, the role of Amanda Kruger in Stephen Hopkins' 1989 release, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Part 5, The Dream Child. The <laughs> Dream Child. The highest grossing slasher movie of 1989. So, yeah. Beatrice, just going right back to the beginning, could you just give us a little bit of your background and how you first got started in acting and what gave you the acting bug? Well, my first um, foray into the world of acting was when I was um, five years old and we were living in Jap Japan. Um, my family had moved to Japan and we lived there for four years. Um, back in the 60s, my parents were studying uh, Asian art history and doing, doing things there. So they put us right into Japanese schools, my sister and I. Um, so I was in kindergarten by myself. My sister was in another school. And so I was the only foreign kid in the whole school. and. Uh, Whenever they would have school plays, I got to play some non-speaking role because I couldn't speak Japanese yet, so I'd usually be an animal. But it was fun being on stage and getting the audience to clap and laugh, and um, that was kind of the first part of it. And then after that, um, I followed um, through middle school and uh, elementary school and high school, being in the drama club, being in all the plays, winning the Best Actress trophy. Um, and uh, You still have it? Uh, I, you know, yes, I do somewhere. I don't know where, but it is somewhere, this little plasticky gold trophy. But anyway, um, I also somewhere had a trophy for Beatrice Bupley second best duck. And it has this golden duck on the top because I was also in 4-H <laughs> and one of my ducks won. So those are my two trophies with my name on it. But anyhow, um, and uh, the other thing with, not only was I loving to do theater um, in, you know, on stage and such, but I also, there was some kind of a escape with, with acting, um, you know, it just kind of helps you be in this imaginary world and be somebody else. So I think a lot of actors, um, especially if you have like troubled childhoods or whatever, um, it's kind of a way to escape. So I found myself, um, you know, just diving into other characters. And when I was playing somebody else, I could be that somebody else and my troubles would be behind me. So it was kind of therapeutic. Um, and so I decided to go on to theater school. Um, it, I've said this before in interviews, so, but um, I had a, basically I had um, decided between either working with horses um, or going into acting and equestrian colleges were super expensive and I couldn't oh, yeah. afford it. So uh, my parents didn't, help us with college we had to pay for our, our own way so i went to chose theater school there was a great program at the university of victoria in british columbia so i went through their four-year program and that's where i got my start and because it was in british columbia and um, vancouver island is right by vancouver yeah uh, it was a great place to launch an acting career because there's there's tons of theater but there's also tons of film there's tons of tv tons everything. of television that was always shot in vancouver because everything. of that setting yeah it's got a unique setting. Yeah. What were some of the things that you, you liked when you were growing up? Films, television, things like that. What were some of the things that you personally gravitated towards? Well, I I honestly, like when I first came back from Japan, um, I watched tons of Sesame Street and Electric Company, um, literally, because I had to learn to um, speak. I could speak English still. Um, I still remember. I think at home in Japan, we spoke in English for the most part, but I had never learned to read or write because mm -hmm. we moved when I was five. So I had to really quickly catch up. So, you know, I was watching Sesame Street, k at cat, yeah. huh, at hat, you know. Yeah. Um, so I kind of watched that stuff. And I also watched Zoom, you know, come on in, Zoom, -a, Zoom, -a, Zoom, -a, Zoom, -a, Zoom, you know, before, <laughs> before our current day Zooming, you know. Yeah. Um, 
So I watched a lot of that stuff, you know, and a lot of the um, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers, and you know, the <laughs> 80s, uh, 70s, 70s, what was that? Yeah, 70s TV, um, Brady Bunch. I mean, come on, you know, I watched all that kind of, you know, lots and lots of 70s TV. Um, and I also like the 70s spooky stuff too, like, you know, the trilogy of terror and Twilight Zone and Outer Cold Limits. Jack the Night Stalker. Yeah, Nor there were the Norlis tapes, right? Yeah, <laughs> and do you remember? I mean, I think a lot of people remember that. I, was it Karen Black, the trilogy of terror with the, yeah. with the voodoo doll? Mm -hmm. And and I don't know if it was part of that one. Which was the one with the the boy? It's a woman. It, I guess it was her. She, you know, she's staying um on this little um apartment right over the ocean, and she's tr it starts off with her. She's trying to call back her son who died. He died in the ocean, and she does these incantations and then there's this knock at the door mommy mommy you know it's pouring raining outside and she opens the door and there's her drowned son and then he ends up like so she brings him in he's he was a dead you know he's supposed to be dead but she brought him back from the dead and then he ends up chasing her around the house with a knife you don't remember that no oh it's so creepy i think it's called one. michael i think his name was michael or something i thought that was part of that trilogy i don't know there were so many back then I know if someone is watching over me, uh, it was a good one. Salem's Lot, that 70s. I love the 70s television horror. Like, those are great. Uh, Cold Check yeah. Night stuff. I got to look that up. If anyone, I got to look. Yeah, it up. was really, really creepy. Um, And then I, 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 I'm getting them mixed up because they were, like I said, there were so many. There was one with um, where they end up pushing a woman in a wheelchair all the way down these stairs outside, like in like a San Francisco kind of setting or something. Yeah. I don't know. There were a lot of, lot of, really sort of psychologically creepy ones that and don't rely on gore they always rely no, on the theater of the mental. mind yeah, yeah that i always i always you know enjoyed and my um and also even in japan we my sister was much more into the macabre stuff and um we read lots of manga japanese comics yep. and um the ones that really appealed to to her so there for me um were a lot of these creepy there was this one that was like the Japanese version of the Island of Dr. Moreau. Yeah, Island of Dr. Moreau is a great story. Yeah, and it had all these, you know, creepy characters. And then there were just so many creepy ones. This guy whose, like, faces would appear on his arm. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, there were... <laughs> <laughs> but I love Japanese horror. Like, it was so scary and so creepy. And I was told so many spooky ghost stories by different babysitters <laughs> when I was living in Japan. <laughs> so I've always loved spooky. Not so much gore. But spooky, I you know, like a know. psycho type, like something that's more yeah. a threat, not gore yeah. and e e e. Yeah, and usually too for me, I mean, what's much more frightening is I think one of the reasons why we are most of us are so scared of clowns and creepy little dolls is you know I think it's when something's supposed to be supposed Peaceful. to be innocent and nice. Yeah, that's yeah. much creepier than somebody who already has a scary face I yeah mean, i don't know do we know anyone with a scary face and but anyway um <laughs> this guy the, no <laughs> no i think yeah, my son actually but um <laughs> but like with japanese heart not my boys if my boys are watching um i knew what you meant i knew you what, know you, what i, meant. I knew what you meant <laughs> but with, with, with japanese ghost stories they're usually um like a lot of times it'd be like a beautiful lady you know like a geisha kind of thing and you just see her from the back or you know the side you know and and you just get you know maybe the side you see like nice eyelashes or something and it looks and then she turns pretty. around and, and she turns uh, its fan of the opera yeah something like <laughs> yeah. that right so it's always I think that unexpected much more scary than just out and out but gore sells though blood sells true why is that I don't know I I I, I really sometimes I think there's a fixation with with violence in a way because we if we can see it or play it in a video game it's okay it's like. It's what, it's what is glossed that? So over. I, I I do wonder, Tom. I do wonder, and and that's something that you know. Obviously, it's not new. It's been around since gladiator days. We've you know, mankind has been cheering and eating their sandwiches and clapping, watching people being hung and whipped, oh, yeah. and killed, and oh yeah, bulls being gored and like what is that? I don't obsession? know. I don't know. I don't know. I love horror movies, but I'll tell you, I love Casablanca as much as the next person. <laughs> right? Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> It's, it, it is an interesting thing to think about because because as we entered the 1980s, the gore just, it got turned up to 11. Right. In some of those movies. And everyone ate it up. And I do wonder, like, is it is it damaging or is it not? 
that we're getting so um what's the word you know getting so used to it what desensitized uh, desensitized like i i remember my sons wanted me to watch um squid games and you know and it's hard to find things nowadays that my sons want to watch with us you know yeah. that we all agree on so you know my husband and i sat down we we watched the first episode and we're like all oh, this blood and guts but it was so well done i mean the characters just drew us in and by the second and third we were totally desensitized we you know because i guess you know it's going to be happening and that people are going to be sh killed you know yeah. um, if they don't make it and but i think you know, you can definitely go get past that if if it's good characters and good story. That's what I was just going to say. There's so there were so many movies, gore fests, you know, or as my friend would call them, torture porn that are just yeah, no character. I feel like if you always the character is always the most important thing in any film or story. Yeah. If you can't get behind your main character or characters or a side who, character, who cares? Who cares exactly? Yeah, yeah. it's I'm, just it's like there's so many. I can't. I don't want to name them off topic just in case. I upset people who think they're the greatest movies of all time, but right. that's a, that, I get you. There's like a desensitization to a desensitivity to it where, yeah. but I'll tell you, I just watched the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre and there were a few scenes in there, even at 34, I kind of went, Ooh. Yeah. So it's, there, there's a lot of stuff, honestly, like to this day. I mean, there's so many shows that if I'm watching with my sons, I, I literally, I do have to close my eyes. Like I can't watch. I mean, they love John Wick. <laughs> um you know and i that over the top action yeah the kill stuff like i have to close my eyes snakes and and really gory stuff and really medical stuff i have to kind of close my eyes and i'm you know for some reason if i watch it through like a slit in my fingers it's not as bad you do like the, you do like the little yeah i kind of like that you know wait till it's like the really gory stuff is over and then i can start watching again but kudos to the korean film industry holy smokes i mean they've gotten me to like vampire uh, um and not what vampire i always like but um zombie stuff i love their zombie films i mean they just and i think it's all when you care about the characters if they develop the characters well like you said you know then it makes it sells it, it, it yeah. makes it more relatable and you feel them getting hurt because you care for them it's almost yeah. like your friend that you're you're with yeah have you ever watched any of the Italian horror back from the 1980s into the 90s, even up until today? They're, they kind of do the uh, the arms sometimes getting chopped off, but they kind of either have too much character, because there's such a thing, or lack of character. And oh, yeah. Most of, most of them have lack. <laughs> huh. Yeah, I can't say no. Uh, do you have any recommendations? Oh, Jesus. Uh, not Jesus. Um, <laughs> Italian horror. Zombie. Uh, well, 1990 Bronx Warriors wasn't horror, but that had character. I'd have to I'd have to think about it a little bit and then get back to you. But yeah, definitely the zombies, uh, zombie. Uh, they were Dawn of the Dead ripoffs. They they okay. they had a good balance of character and gore. Oh, speaking of ripoffs, you know, um, India. I'm pretty sure it's in India has a Freddy Krueger knockoff character. Really. Yeah, it's like, you know, they don't call him Freddy Krueger, but it's a guy, I, th I think he even has a striped sweater, I'm not sure, but he definitely has the burnt <laughs> face and the claw hands, and they give him a different name, but yeah, not that wild? And the Wes Craven estate didn't go after them, or they they, they, they I, ripped I, it off in a way where they got away with it? I'm not sure. It's it's a tricky slope to get over there, and, you know, you have to, I've you know, I don't know. Legality-wise, I don't know what's happened, um, but I've, I've, uh, I've seen... I've seen clips from it, and it's like, oh yeah, that's definitely Freddy. I mean, what else would would it be? <laughs> so, so you're in Vancouver, going back to your days in, right. in tr training. Yeah, Vancouver. You decided to be a television actress, film actress, actress for hire. Anything? Yeah, just, yeah, just actress for hire, and and that's one of the things I um, so love about the Canadian film, uh, the Canadian um, industry, the actors industry, um, is that, and I, I from from my connection with my friends who are still working really actively up there, it's, it's, it hasn't changed in that you're really accepted as an actor um, in, in Canada. So what that means is you want to be acting. So you can be in a commercial one day, then you can be on TV, then you can play a little guest star role or a day player on a film, and then the next day star in a film, and then play one of the characters in an ensemble in theater and then another day the lead in theater and you kind of just move and keep working and working they let Everyone, you work they let you work and work and work and, and they don't put you in a box and um hollywood my experience of it was as soon as i got there they just 
put me in a box. And it, the first role I had done was Elm Street. And then after that, all my auditions were only for horror film. You know, in retrospect now, um, looking at all the horror films and looking at the the wealthy horror film actors that, you know, did it as a career, it was stupid of me. I should have taken them. But, you know, you you do what you do. I, at the time, at the time I uh, just didn't want to be put into a box. You know, I had done so much for so long. And then after doing one role to just be, you know, cornered off into only doing horror films. And I think also, um, and a p number of people have asked me what, which ones were they? I honestly don't, I really don't recall because I just remember just being horrified by the scripts. Like I'd read them and they were like, oh, just got awful, just awful, awful, awful. Like, you know, the, the one I do recall was something to do with big bosom women on barely dressed on motorcycles, <laughs> you know, getting raped or attacked by Satan or I don't really know. They were just, Oh, they were awful. And, and, and I just wow. would read these scripts and be like, what? Like, I couldn't believe my agent even sent them to me. Where's and, the character? Where's the, yeah, you things know, like that. Yeah. If it had been, you know, something else, I, I, I probably would have been, but anyway, but that's one of the reasons I ended up, one of the big reasons I ended up leaving the industry and in, because it was like, come on, you know, it's, I've done 10 years, um, up until that point, I had been acting in all kinds of stuff. And after doing one film in LA, that's it. That's the only auditions I got. Just horror films. Horror like, films. Like, come on, guys, you know. So, the, yeah. Matt Hart says, hey there, Beatrice Bubbly. Hello, Matt. How are you, sir? Matt's been a Facebook fan friend for many, many years. That's good. Thanks for watching tonight, Matt. Yeah. So, so Beachcombers was one of your first things, a little bit television role, but then it went to 21 Jump Street. You worked with Johnny Depp. It's, it's a bit part in the episode, what's it called? New Generation? I think New, it's New Generation. New Generation, yeah. Or but you worked with David Nutter, who was a legendary television director. Do you have any re uh, recollections of that set with, you know, soon-to-be legend Johnny Depp? Um, well, I do. My recollections were um, definitely, I, God, I wish I, sh I gotta, you know, I'm going to look it up one of these days. The two guest stars, in addition to myself, um, one of them, the redheaded guy, he was on um, National Lampoon Vacation. He was the son Yeah. in those. He guest starred on it. And then the blonde guy that was another guest star, he's been on a ton of stuff. Anyway, so the three of us were the guest stars and then there was the regular cast and so kind of the three of us hung out together during the i think it was one or two weeks of filming um you know we had a blast but the the elm street gang was very um you know they were a close-knit group by this point this was like their third year or something of the show or fourth year or who knows what so yeah. they were already you know very much a gang they were very welcoming for sure um but um unfortunately fortunate whatever johnny depp because my scenes were all with him that's not yeah. unfortunate that was nice but um <laughs> he um you know he, as we as we now realize you know he was a to be huge actor um and i think he was at the time frustrated and bored of just being he was being boxed into like the teeny bopper he, he wanted to crash the ceiling he wanted to yeah. You yeah. know, and at the time it was Tiger Beat. He was just all about, you know, he was on that. And I think he was frustrated and, and kind of getting bored and restless. So to make things a little more interesting for himself, he was always doing little pranks, which is so much fun if you're part of the cast, but it's not so great if you're the guest that's just It's like a hazing almost. It's like a hazing. And so every time the, you know, the camera was about to come on, you know, my, my close up, he would hand me a joke. Like you'd write something silly, you know, and it was throw me like it was funny. And, but I wasn't that I hadn't had enough film experience to be able to just, you know, I mean, I did okay. I, I, I survived it, but it, it, it was hard. Cause you know, you know, you're trying, you know, cause with film in particular, like on stage, once you're on stage, you're in your character, you, you know, you have to hit your marks. But other than that, you know, it, it's there's no, there's natural. no new take. You got to nail yeah. it. You got to nail not, it. You just roll with it. Right. Whereas on, on, on film, you know, it's so like, you know, especially TV, like these sets, you know, like if you have to turn your head this way, if you go just like that, you know, you're out of the light and then they have yeah. to, so, you know, there's so many technical things that you're trying to keep track of in addition to your lines and then trying to be real and connecting, you know, and all that stuff. So then you throw in a line, which had nothing to do with our characters, you know, it, it was t tricky for me and he did it a lot. And I, you know, at the time I was not particularly appreciative of it. But um, 
I mean, I'm, I, I love practical jokes and I, you know, I'm a prankster myself, but, um, I, I would, I don't think I would ever do it to a new newbie on set, you know, just because, you know, they're nervous and you know, whatever. They're scared. They're yeah. scared in a way. They're, there's nerves. Uh, Matt Hart says, never stop doing what you're good at. Beatrice Buckley. I'm doing awesome. Thank you. Mm. Yay, Matt. So after 21, you did Christmas in Willow Creek. Right. And then. Oh, so can, yeah. Christmas comes to Willow Creek. It was um, the two Tom guys. Pat and John Schneider. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so I was the girlfriend of, was it John Schneider? Who's the blonde one? Schneider. Yeah. I, I Tall played, guy. Yeah. He, cool guy, too. He, yeah, he was cute, but um, my, I'm pretty sure my lines are all cut. I think I just end up, I don't think like I have there. any lines. Yeah, I'm just there. Yeah. You know, he's got his arm around me or whatever, and he's flirting with the other one, with the other one's girl. Um, but you know who else is in that, which is really interesting, is, so there's a, if anyone ever sees it, it's a TV, you know, TV movie but um there's those a scene. were cool back in the day though those tv movies were cool weren't they yeah so yeah, they and, and there are there are who's who of of everyone in vancouver because like all the townspeople all everybody else other than the big main stars were all vancouver actors yeah. but um so there's this scene we're in a bar um and you know he's got his arm around me and then tom walpat and the, the lead girl i can't remember what her name was she did a lot of TV. Anyway, so my guy is flirting with her. And so me and Tom Walpat are getting pissed off. Anyway, a waitress comes, takes our order, and then leaves. She's wearing a cowboy hat. That is Karen Conival, who's a Vancouver actress. And she's the one, if anyone watches the Planet of the Apes, the last three ones with... Um... Franco? Yeah. And um, yeah, I know which one. Yeah. Matt Reeves yeah. directed them, I think. Yeah. Yeah. She plays Maurice, the orangutan. Really? Yeah. It's so cool. You know, she's this, she's smaller than me. She's this tiny petite woman, but you know, it's all uh, motion capture. Yeah. So she, and she really studied the orangutans, you know, how to, she still works with them and um, you know, she really got to know them and I think she does a fabulous job and it's so fun to watch like your friend being, you know, her eyes, you know, you know that she's that orangutan. You know it's but, her. Yeah. And yet it's so real. Right. And plus Planet of the Apes was my favorite anyway, growing up it's, we, my sister and I always called it P of A. We, we played Planet of the Apes. She wouldn't let us play with Barbie dolls, my sister. So we played with P of A, Planet of the Apes. We had Charlton Argo Hustle. and, yeah. Those movies and the TV show aren't bad. Those, no. Some of those sequels are kind of. Kind of, yeah. They get a yeah. little, yeah. But I did love them. I just loved the whole, you know, that opening scene. I remember as a kid, it was like, whoa, you know, with those weird X's on the sand. And yep. the, the whole concept was really, really I loved it, and I didn't like the. I, I gotta confess, I did not like the remake as much. The one that that Tim Burton did with Marky. That Mark. was the only one I did not like. I, I saw that. Like I saw that in theaters with my father, and I he took me to see it. Oh God, Jesus! I must have been like maybe eleven, maybe twelve, thirteen, four, probably yeah. thirteen. And I saw it, and I was just like, "No, you no, know, this yeah. sucks." Oh, right? God, this sucks. Yeah, I did not like that one, and I love Planet of the Apes. Yeah, yeah. I did not like that one either. No, I agree. But the but the recent ones and 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 um nice to meet you too, man. Caesar, Caesar, which is um come on, Gollum and everybody he plays everybody. Who's the actor who was Caesar? In the new one? In yeah. the, the in the Marky Mark one? In the new one. And he he plays Gollum. And he oh, plays Oh um He does all this motion capture stuff. Andy Circus. Andy Circus. Yeah. Andy Circus, who will be playing Fabulous. Alfred. He'll be playing Alfred in the next Batman film. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah and I, I saw that. I was just like, wow, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So my friend Karen, you know, obviously she got to know him very well because they yeah. worked together in all all three of those films. But um, yeah, that's really cool. I'd love to do mocap. I'd love to do something. Place. God, it'd be so cool to play something else, like a horse or a I don't know. Or a monkey. In fact, actually, at one point, I I got my husband to make um, out of some two canes the the arm support yeah. that they use to do that monkey walk. And I started to do it up and down the driveway. I was trying to train myself to be able to do that um, so I could walk like a monkey. But and did everyone kind of like drive by, just kind of go? Yeah. Okay. Another weird thing. <laughs> They're used to weirdness going on in my around here. You look like a monkey, and you smell like one too. Anyway, um, yeah. So, so Nightmare yeah. 5 came a little after 21. So we kind of get to, we have to come to the dream child now. Yeah. Well, just before that, we, let's not skip. Can't skip shoot, kill. And, no, stakeout. 
Oh, with Dreyfus. Dreyfus and Emilio movie. Estevez. That was actually yeah. one of my favorite movies. Like in terms of movies that I've been in that I would say to my family, watch, it's a good movie. Is you yeah. know, State Cut was really good. It was actually a very good movie. And those two, both Emilio and, and Richard Dreyfus, were just the bomb to work with. Top of their game at that time, too. Dreyfus has been so consistent. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely guy. You know, I, I, I've told stories about him before, but anyway, yeah, no, we really connected uh, both of them and I, and I'm, I'm super grateful for that. Um, John Badham, the director. Uh, yeah. And then my two, my quarantine and matinee and then, then nightmare came along. How did shoot to kill come around though? Just sort of, uh, uh, cause I saw that I saw shoot to kill at a very young age and I, cause yeah. my father was a big Tom bear is a big Tom Berenger fan. And Sydney Portier is one of those greatest. Uh, right? bad rest of the soul. Yeah. What a great but, actor. Shoot to kill also was, so that's one of those things where, um, I can't remember if it was before or after stakeout or quarantine. I really don't remember the timing cause there was a lot going on around the same time. It seems time. like it's all kind of, it it's all together. those late eighties. Like it was just like yeah. one thing after another, boom, 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 working a lot. But that's what I mean about the fluency in Canada where you can be the lead. You star in a film one day and then you do a, a walk on part on, you know, in, in Shoot to Kill, it was a speaking role, but it was like a, a day player. I play a nun. A nun. <laughs> you know? Well, it's a, it's a, I, I played a policeman, an undercover police who was dressed as a nun. Yeah. Um, and the other undercover police was played by this wonderful actor, Blue Mankuma, and he played the priest. And so it's a nun and a priest. And I think there was another girl dressed as a nun. But anyway, so we, you know, even if they hadn't cut it, <laughs> there were a few lines um, while they're, while they're trying to catch catch the bad guys um yeah. uh and then of course when i watched it my lines were all cut i'm you know still in there it happens but what is what is that feeling like i've talked to a few actors and they've given me a different from your perspective when you're in a film or show in your lot most of your lines are cut and in some cases sometimes roles are cut is that a is that a bad feeling or is yes. that just sort of like part sure. of the business yeah it's part of the business but it's you, you know you'd be lying to say it's it's not a bad feeling i mean i i try not to take it super personally i know mm -hmm. It, you know, and especially when you're playing a smaller role, I know absolutely like in any film, they're going to film a lot more than than they're going to use that you you have to because you don't know what it's going to work out to be when you and start flow. editing. Yeah. So with it with so there's always superfluous scenes. And when they're editing, they have to be really, really careful. And sometimes if your entire role is cut, it's for continuity. Um, so I'll give you an example. And this was the worst time. Um, for me of being cut in a film where I did take it very personally. It was really horrible. I, I was in um, a made for movie, made, made for TV movie called um, Laura Lansing Slept Here. I th think that's what it was called. Anyway, it was starring dun, 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 Catherine Hepburn. That for me was a real like, whew, oh my, I couldn't believe it. Um, so I played Catherine Hepburn's, she, the film was about Catherine Hepburn was playing an author. Mm -hmm. And she, but apparently she would write these, you know, high flute and tootin stories with, you know, with all these rich people and her, I guess she was, her books weren't selling so well. So her, if I recall correctly, so her editor is telling her, you know, you have to start writing about the common people. And she's like, oh, I don't know anything about them, you know, or whatever. And um, common people. Yes. So she, um, so the scenes, I, I was in about three scenes and I play her agent's secretary. So she, every time she comes into the office, I'm she there. She had to come by you. Yeah. And, you know, and I'd greet her and whatever. And at one point when she's trying to figure out common people, she says, oh, you know, where do you come from? And I, I, I tell her that I'm from Hoboken, New Jersey, which was so funny because at the time I had no idea where Hoboken, New Jersey was because <laughs> I was up in Vancouver. And my son is currently in Hoboken, New Jersey, going to um, uh, Stevens Institute of Technology. He's going to college there. So it kind of wow. came around anyway. So I have, and so she's like, Oh, Hoboken. So she ends up choosing to live with a family out of Hoboken to, to be with the commoners. Okay. So, you know, I knew that it wasn't a lot of scenes, but I had, you know, two or three with a, you know, with, two or Catherine, three lines Hepburn. with Catherine Hepburn. Right. And she gave me autographed a book, Beatrice marvelous working with you. It was just like really so cool. Anyhow, I get an invitation to the screening, the premiere screening. And I'm all excited. So I brought my boyfriend at the time and my agent. So the three of us show up for the screening and become, you know, and everyone's Catherine Hepburn, everybody's there. 
and as we come to the the walk into the door the the agent or the producers there's two of them they look at me and they're like and they look at each other and then you could see they were sort of uncomfortable and they're like hi welcome and there was something like and i noticed it at the time like that's weird but i didn't know why so i go in with my agent we sit down and we're watching the film we're watching the film and then i'm like okay here it comes here it comes was it just show oh. her walking into the office type you know, thing? Yeah, yeah they just somehow and my scene I, you didn't see me at all and then i was like oh that scene got cut what a bummer and then so we wait a while longer i'm like no no it'll, there's another scene and then it's about time for that scene. I'm like, okay, here, here we go, here we go. And it was completely cut again. Uh, I was completely cut. There wasn't one peak of my character ever. Like you just didn't even see it. And then when the credits rolled, I wasn't even in the credits. And I was like, and my agent's looking at me, and I, I'm choked up to hear. I'm, I'm, I'm about to, like, I'm, I want to cry. You're about but I'm, ready to go, yeah. Yeah, oh. I mean, because it was or horrible. Because I invited people, you know, and I, you know, and. And when we got up, I just was like, they were having a little reception. I'm like, just get me out of here. I want to get out of here. And I was trying to hide my face. And the producers came running up and they're like, we're so, so sorry. You were such, a, it was a delightful character, but we were 15 minutes or five minutes or something over. And we just kept trying and trying and trying. We couldn't find a place anywhere else to shave it. So we had to cut, cut your character out. And um, they said, we're so sorry. We forgot to let you know like we you yeah. know they wouldn't have normally sent me an invite to the screening like why you know they probably would have said you know we're so sorry you're you're you've been cut but you know you're welcome to come but they had forgotten to do that so i was and then i remember after that you know on the drive home i was telling my agent i'm like i'm done i please i, I don't want to do this anymore i don't want to be an actor anymore i was totally ready to quit i was so mortified by that experience and he's like oh my god stop it's part of the business do you know how many big stars have been everyone cut from cut, films yeah you know? and you know i you know thank goodness got over it but that was that you know you asked if i how i felt about it that was a hard one you know and i knew it wasn't personal but also as an actor too there's always a part of you that's like oh is it because my performance sucked you know but generally speaking no that's not the case because they wouldn't have hired you if yeah. you couldn't do it but anyway. they don't hire people who can't cut it it was just yeah. sadly continuity and commercial time and things like exactly. that exactly so I, you know, so I don't put it on my resume because I don't have any credit on it. I wish, though, it, what would be nice is when they do cut you from things, if they could give you at least the footage, it would be kind of nice. For your I mean, reel, for your, yeah. yeah. I would have loved to see my scenes with Catherine Hepburn. I mean, you know, even if I'd never showed it to anyone else. Who wouldn't? Right? So, anyway. I did not know that. That's a, You learn something new every day, and I'm sorry that happened to you. Yeah, yeah. Never forget it. Anyhow, I'm sorry. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So then, uh, take me to the dream child. How did the dream child come your way? So the dream child. So I had just moved to LA, um, and it was after I had been starring in you know these two. They there was a big film screening, um, or oh no, it was at the Vancouver Film Festival where both Quarantine and Matinee were premiering, and also a. a so you a shot Quarantine before Nightmare. Yeah, because I always remembered in the trailer for quarantine, and you shared it on social media. I shared it on things like that. They advertise you as you from know, Elm Street, as yeah. from Elm Street Five, and I remember I was that watching shows them, you like, how quick. Yeah, that shows you how quick um, Elm Street came out because quarantine. You know, most films take a year after we film film to be released, and, post and all that, and editing yeah. and things like and, yeah. But because Elm Street just like they just whipped it together and. Were, were, the were they were they drunk off the power of Nightmare Four? Because that you hear that in some of the horror franchises. Besides, not Nightmare. I mean, Halloween was prime example of that. Yeah, and so, Nightmare suffered from that. I think so. I mean, Four was so successful, and you know, they were so excited with you know how that was being received and whatnot. And they just, I guess, they wanted to just jump on the bandwagon really quick, um, <laughs> and grab Robert before he changed his mind or whatever it was. And um, so they just whip that out i mean the filming as you've heard from everybody was just crazy you know three different sets going on all at once and filming like you know the director would be it on one scene as soon as we're done on that set he runs to the next set goes you know does that scene runs to the next so he was just like bopping and, and around stephen hopkins was a young hot director at the time totally yeah and that's that's actually my agent had told me to you know this I, is the guy yeah i almost like 
I was like, oh, I don't know, you know, horror film. I don't know. <laughs> Stupid me. But she's that like, was my, that was my next question was how were you aware of the weight of horror franchises at that time? And not like at 1988 all. at all. Like not you at knew, all. You didn't know the, the, the impact that Halloween and Jason and, and no. Jesus, I think Psycho had even come back at that point. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I had no idea. Like I had no idea. And, and, you know, I was aware, absolutely, I was aware of um, Nightmare on Elm Street because I'd seen it, the first one. I saw it in high school. Was it high school? I would guess so. 1984 it came out. Oh, then college. My last year of college because I graduated in 84. But anyway, yeah, so I had seen um, Elm Street. but um, Class of 84? <laughs> yeah, class of 84. So, um, oh but I no, I was not aware at all at the time. And so I almost turned it down and my I, I almost didn't do the audition and my agent's like no 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 you've got to meet this guy Stephen Hopkins he's from Australia he's going to be real up and coming you know meet him you know at least do the audition and um and it was the you know I think that was the only time other than matinee which just gave me the role without auditioning um, um Elm Street they cast me right there and then you know I just did my audition on the you spot are yeah. you are Amanda Kruger yeah. before we get more into Elm Street Matt Hart has a question which film of yours do you watch the most of that you were in, if at any? Um, probably none of them, to be honest with you, just because my family won't watch them. <laughs> They're so mean. Um, I think I did recent, like within the last couple of years, make one of my friends sit down and watch either Quarantine or Matinee with me. But other than that, I really don't. I don't watch any of the films I've been in. I've seen it makes scenes, sense. It, you know. it makes sense. Yeah. And scenes and things like that. Yeah. But I mean, you know, for enjoyment, I don't know. Yeah. I, I actually really don't. Hmm. And Nightmare 5 is the one that you everyone knows. It's, that, that's, I mean, yeah. Freddy Krueger and all that. So, yeah. So you're on set, you get cast, you're going to play the role of Amanda Krueger, the nun. Yeah. What kind of goes through your head? Like you, this, you said there's sort of a naive nature to not knowing the gravity of the franchise and the expectations of fans. Yeah. But it's kind of got to hit you at one point where you're like, oh, shit, this is like a big deal, even though it's chaotic. Yeah. Well, it was weird that, I mean, I, I loved, I loved every minute of the experience on set. It was just, you know, the cast members were great. I mean, I, I think I, I, and again, I got to look up the name, but there was the woman who played um, one of the nurses. Um, she was a nun that hands me Freddie. She says, you know, this is one of God's creatures. Take solace in that. Yeah. I don't know why she never does shows. She should be doing shows. But anyway. Um, it's a powerful line. Yeah. And we got, you know, we, we got along so well. We were having such a blast. Everyone was having a good time on it. The sets were phenomenal. Um, That's what I love about Far Five, the look, the sets. That right? must have been, yes. They were so cool. And, I, and I've and i never been on um, anything like it. You know, that the, the church scene was just gothic and beautiful and, and the smoke and the lighting and the, the whole Escher stair thing was amazing. And the, and the hospital scene, you know, that gross operating room, you know, was just so evocative of whatever the mood was at the time. Like, I, I loved it. It was really like walking into that world. What I was not aware of, um, a couple of things, obviously the grab, like how big this franchise really is or oh, was yeah. or would become, um, you know, how loved Freddy Krueger was and the fact that I'm playing his mom, Mother. you know, just, you know, like that's, that's, yeah, I, I, it just didn't, it really didn't click for me until very recently, just the last few years, I think that I'm like, wow, that's pretty special, you know. <laughs> it's it's got to be humbling, though. It's got it's, it it's got it's got to be weird and humbling. Oh, for sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and 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 I had just recently said this too, but um, you know, it was I think it was a good thing, um, in some ways that I was not aware at the time that Amanda Kruger had been played before by Nan Martin. I, yeah. you know, because I had not seen three, so um. When we were filming Elm Street Five, I had only seen number one. I never saw two, three, or four, um, so I had no idea that anyone had ever played her. Um, so I didn't have a reference. I just did it like, you know, your take it, on the character. My take on the character, and that was the one thing that Stephen Hopkins. We were, um, we were talking a lot about it, um, especially at the audition, and then and then you know on set was, you know, okay, so she's dead but she's not really dead so like 
should she be like more like a ghost or is she human at the time? Like, how, how do you play, you know, and he didn't give me direction in terms of my character, how I felt inside that was he let me do my own actor's work and every mm -hmm. actor does it, you know, when, whether you're playing a, you know, a, the, the bad guy or whatever, um, you know, even more so, I think when you play a bad guy, you really have to, you have to like yourself or like yourself in as much as people like themselves. I mean, a lot of us don't like ourselves or, you know, we all have our issues with ourselves, but, um, you know, you certainly have to believe yourself and you have to at least know believe in why you do the bad things or so for me as freddie's mom i knew from the get-go like i knew that i was going to be i loved my child like i i loved him but this couldn't go on you know and i knew that he was destroying people he was killing people and and i had i felt responsible and i felt like i had to stop it but but at the same time it wasn't a joyful thing like i did not want to destroy him and i think you honestly convey that in the way you carry your lines you know obviously you know the, the your curse and then the way actually the scene where you come in it's the, the picture of your face and you just go i will not allow it the, there's reluctance but there's determination at the same time Thank and it's one know. of those like was that something that you kind of just found within yourself reading it like yeah this, just this is this is what she's got to do she's got to do yeah because the the thing that i carried with me the whole time was this mother's love for her child and you know what mother could possibly want to kill her own child doesn't matter how bad the child's been it's going to be painful because they're a part of you you know yeah. and um so and i think that is going to be conveyed even more in the book <laughs> that, that that was my next question talk to me a little bit about nightmare before elm street and this yeah. little project because this this intrigues the hell out of me all yeah. in full transparency this intrigues me this is a day one purchase, pre-order, whatever. Yeah. Whatever the lingo is, whatever it is, I'm in. Awesome. Well, you know, not for nothing. I mean, I've lived with this character for 32 years, right? Amanda Kruger. And um, in, in as much as the preparation I did before playing her, you know, coming up with her background, which, you know, all actors do, you know, you, you need to think in your mind, okay, where am I coming from when I come on to set? Like, did I just come out of the bathroom? Did I come, where did I come, where, when I step into scene, where, where am I? You know, you, 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 you need to know that like that, the audience doesn't need to know. And but was that tough to for you with her, with that character because of her being dead, dead and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, once we decided, well, once we decided how it was, you know, that we'll just play her like now she's alive. You brought me back to give you life. So taking those lines, then for that time being in that weird realm, she was yeah. alive. So I just went with it. So I was like, okay, I'm here, you know, and, and I've been dead, but I'm, I'm aware of what happened. I'm aware that, you know, he's brought me back, you know, and, and, but, you know, so she's very, very aware by this time. And she's had many, many years in the tower to think about it. <laughs> um, that was a great scene, the tower scene. I, I know, I know it's like just the way the, you know, the, the, the character's back because, you know, the way they superimpose the image of you just going, oh, thank you. Which, which I'm so stoked about. So, um, I don't know if you saw on the Facebook, I've, 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 on my Facebook post and on Instagram yesterday, and I think today I posted two things, um, on this, I'm allowed to say it now, the, the horror gods are doing this pin for me for me, for them, for the world, um, of Amanda Kruger holding baby Freddie, And Amanda's face is the skeleton. Originally, it was going to be my like my face, and then you slide it, and then there's a skeleton underneath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. But then they came up with the concept of doing the baby Freddy, which I think is even cooler. I mean, I think most people like already the, the skeleton face. So the skeleton face and the baby Freddy are glow in the dark. Um, and it's Amanda, you know, holding him. And so they're making a pin of that, which I'm hoping to be able to have ready for the next show I'm doing, which I don't know why they won't announce me yet. I, they, I've already had signed the contract. I'm definitely appearing in the Northeast in April, somewhere not too far from where New York, <laughs> but I'm, I, they haven't announced me, so I can't announce it. I'm not allowed to announce it before they do, but I, I will be there and I'm hoping that the, the pin will be ready for that. And then there's another show in August 
also more or less on the East Coast. But again, they haven't announced they haven't done the announcement. So we're apparently not allowed to announce before the shows where we're appearing. The only one I can announce officially is the one I've been announcing all along, which is England, which unless you're from the UK, I probably won't see you there, but it's at the Hampshire Horror Con. Um, and a bunch of us from Elm Street 5 and 2 will be there in England. Talk to, t talk to, uh, I know how the process goes on to get you guys at conventions, but tell the viewers who are watching this, what is the process if you want to see the Nightmare 5 cast or, or any right. movie cast? Can you, can right. you guys, can you tell people yeah. that one? That so story? I actually tried to um, post this on my Facebook um, to let um, fans know. And I think some people still didn't really quite understand the concept is if you're, if you're Robert England, forget it. Everybody wants you. If they can yeah. afford you, they want you. You don't have to worry about it. Um, even if, if you're Heather, Heather, if you're, um, Lisa, Jamie Lee, Jamie Lee Curtis, Jamie you Lee know, Curtis. just other oh, examples. Yeah. yeah. The big stars, that's fine. They will be at whatever show they want to be at. Right. But everyone else, um, generally speaking, the um, common people, the common, <laughs> yes, the commoners <laughs> as the commoners Sorry. of your horror films and such. Um, we do get invited to shows, uh, but generally it will happen if you're asked for. So what they, what the different shows need is for fans who want to see you say, we want to see Beatrice Bubbly from Elm Street five. We want to see so-and-so from this and so-and-so from this. And if there's enough people asking for you, then you will get invited and they will contact our agents and we will then be invited to the show. Um, they are shows people say, oh, well, why don't you just come to this one? Why don't you come to that one? You if we're not, show up. <laughs> you can't just show up. if you're not, I mean, I, I will say as Freddie Krueger's mom, there's not many shows that would say, no, you can't come if I took a vendor's table. But I mean, you know, that means that I have to pay for myself. I mean, yep. I, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm, I, I, as much as I love meeting the fans and that truly is the number one reason, but the number two reason is I do need to make money and yep. I'm trying, trying to pay for my kids college. So, um, so I can't afford to pay for the hotel and fly out and all that yep. too. It's not That's cheap. Easy. It's it's not it's not as easy as just oh let's go in the car and go to yeah. Milwaukee exactly. for the weekend. You know it's exactly. Just, yeah. So we you know so so it really does require people asking for us by name. And the other thing that I found, and this is why I started, I just got myself an Instagram account uh, about three four weeks ago, and I've been pumping it on Facebook. Is I learned that especially with some of the bigger shows. Unless you like, if they are going to do a Nightmare on Elm Street five um, reunion, then I don't have to worry. Of course, they're going to ask me. But yeah. if they're just doing their general show, they'll go, "Oh, okay, Scream just came out. Let's do some cast from Scream." You, you strike while the Scream. iron's hot. You, you, yeah. you go with what's trending. Yeah. And then they might say, "Oh, you know, okay, well, we did a few uh, Elm Street people last time. Who who should we, you know, who should we go with?" If they get a suggestion or two, they're going to check your your meaning my um social media and if there's a lot of followers that then they are going to be more likely to ask me because they'll say oh well that means a lot more people will come and buy tickets to see her if they only see a few followers they're going to say oh nobody wants to see her <laughs> i mean it's horrible but it puts us in that position where we're having to like kind of plead for followers and and i'm noticing like all the bigger actors who've been doing you know bigger in the in industry who've been doing these um cons and stuff for a long time have like Hundred and fifty thousand followers. There's a there's like a convention circuit. There's like a process that a lot of these people, from the horror community to other things, comic books, they have their way of trying to get work. out there. They yeah. they 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 have their way. And the ones I will say, like people that like if you're if you've done a recent show, you're set because the um, producers and you know the whole um, the whether it's the um, uh, like Warner Brothers or whoever owns the film, they have their own PR people and they buy yeah. you. Like I, I don't want to say buy your fans, but they they do. Like they they set it up for you. Um, I know I've met some some people who at at these horror conventions lately who've been in the more recent shows. Yeah. Who have like a hundred or two hundred fifty thousand followers. They weren't all individually one at a time people. It was you know blasted out through the through these um, through the PR bigger PR. So you know. They start off with already a, a pretty strong base um, uh, on those things. Those of us, you know, from films from 30 years ago, you kind of have to, most people didn't even know I was on an Instagram. I didn't even know about Instagram. So I'm just learning. Um, but yes, yeah, so for fans, 
if you say, oh, please come to our town, we would love to, but you need to ask your local show. I, I know of three people who personally requested Nightmare 5 for a state not far away from where you and I are from, in case I don't want to say it just in case it's in the workings. But uh, that's how you, that's how you do it. You have to ask to see certain casts and crew. Yeah, and I got to tell you guys, you know, uh, the Nightmare Gangs, we, we're we're a fun bunch of people. Every like as I said, everyone that I've met has been such a blast, and um, I can only speak like really well for the Nightmare on Elm Street Five crew. All of us, like we're fun, fun people. So invite us. We will have a good time, <laughs> and we love hanging out with each other. We love hanging out with you guys. But I my missed... book. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But you know, um, once the book is done, oh, did we talk about it yet? A little bit. You talked about. We talked about it before. But I, the book, Nightmare Before Elm Street. Is it yes. just Nightmare Before Elm Street, or? Well, um, it, that's sort of the idea. Night. Uh, I'm not set 100% if that's going to be the title or Amanda Kruger's Curse um, or something like that. But basically, and it's. 85% written um, now, and we're working out with the artwork and such. Um, but it's Amanda Kruger's history going back to before she was born, her birth, what caused her to become a nun, and then what happened. Freddy, the, then we the... know about we know about the incident with Freddie. Then when Freddie's born, what was their relationship and what happened all those years? Because clearly Freddie knows who his mom is, you know, and so yeah. they did have contact and she was watching from a distance what was going on with him yeah. and um, and what caused her stepfather, his his Freddie's adoptive father, Alice Cooper, you know, what caused him to be the way he was. It goes <laughs> into all of that. Like it really kind of gives the background of all of that um, and uh, a lot of you know, Nightmare on Elm Street lore. And, and I will say, the one thing I'll say is it stays true to the plot lines on every movie. Like it doesn't go against any of them. It works in with it. Um, I so yeah. want the book. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I will say though, um, it was interesting because in doing the research for, you know, really going through every article I could read, um, watching the movies over and over again, you know, writing down every date and time timeline that was there. They don't 100% work. When you look at Freddy Krueger's birth and you look at Amanda Krueger's birth and Freddy's death yeah. and the, the year that he killed his wife and, you know, so his daughter was six and you, you kind of put all those dates together. They're not 100% um, accurate. If there had been a continuity director on all the films going through, there wouldn't, but it's not too far off. And in my book, I make it correct. Um, people also, I've noticed his birth date. Some people have it, um, as November or something like that, but um, a 42 and it's impossible because his, he was conceived right around Christmas. Remember that's when yes. she got locked in the tower. So it really would be May, right? I think December, January, February, May, March, April, May, June, July. Oh no. Or August, whatever it is. I, I worked it out that it, it's the actual um, birth date. Now that, what made you, what was the inspiration behind this? What made you just say, I, I got to tell the story. I got to tell the story. I've lived with this character for 32 years. There's so many X amount of years whenever people decide to watch this particular show. Yeah. What made you just go, I need to revisit Amanda Kruger? Is it for the fans, for you? Like, what's the. I got to say, and the reason why I'm going to use his Stephen. I love, I love that image. Yeah. And the reason I'm going to use that as the cover, like, look at her eyes and her face. I don't know if you can see it. I'm you can't, zoom in on it. Yeah, you can't really seem to see too much, but it's like it's clearly it's clearly me. Um, but it it also like somehow it just captured she's she's a really sympathetic and in, intense character. And I and I've been reading a lot of stuff that different fans over the years have said about her or written about her. Um and Mostly good when she well, said, oh, yeah, always, yeah, always, always good. I haven't, good. I haven't read anything bad said about Amanda Kruger, not at all. Um, and it is, it's, it's an intriguing character, and, and it is the only character, um, straight out that Freddie's scared of. Freddie's you know? scared of his mother. He's, he's, he's scared of his mom, and, and that whole mother son relationship. It's a powerful thing, and it's something we can all kind of relate to. Um, and, and the struggle of loving something but having to it's destroy evil. it and it's evil and there's there's just a lot there and her story i don't know 
I guess it's been it's been haunting me. Yes, will it have a lot of pictures, a lot of artwork? I'm. It's going to be different artists. Um, I've talked with each of the artists, um, and they are all okay that it, it's going to be shared with um, different artists. I think that'd be more fun for the fans to see. Um, no photographs. It's just all going to be artwork because it's. But uh, uh, going to have some be, colorful, that, glossy pages. You would have to go through some legal process too, wouldn't you, to, well, to get a picture of you and maybe wit and, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, things like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It won't go all the way up. This this one won't go up to five. It won't go into that. Oh, what's that sound? That was weird. Um, it's gonna. Is that my? Mic? I think it was my microphone. Okay. Um, it the story Sorry. takes us all the way up to both Freddie and Amanda's death, which happened yeah. the same year that he that he is killed and then she kills herself. Um, it, it takes us up to that. What I think is interesting is that this is, as you said, this has haunted you very similar to how Amanda Kruger has been haunted. It's like kind of life imitating art, imitating life kind of yeah. in a way, minus the fact your child doesn't kill people. <laughs> yeah. We hope. I hope not. <laughs> Boys. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So, um, but she's, you know, I, I, uh, that is so cool. That is it, so cool. Right. And and I can't wait to get the pin. I'm just I'm in love with this. I'm in love with her. And, you know, she's a hero for me. She and she is for a lot of people. Um, the mom of these beasts, you know, these creatures. And uh, but what intrigues me the most, too, is she does feel guilty. And, you know, she does feel that um, she played a role in, in how he turned out the way he did. But um, and it. Well, I won't give away too much, but no spoilers. Uh, you, but you can imagine some of it. The only spoiler will be that um, we learn how he got his green and yellow, green and red sweater, which Tom and I not coordinated, not planned yeah, at all. Yeah, there we go. Right there we go. Yeah, green and red. Yeah. Green and red. Yeah. So yeah. I only picked the red because I didn't want to wear black and look like Vincent Price in House on the Haunted Hill. That's the reason why I wasn't wearing black. There you go. Well, I actually was wearing black, and then I realized um, with this back, I don't know, somehow it just looked punky, so I just put on green. Yeah, that's why I, that's the, I was just like... Besides <laughs> green, it. I think it shows my eyes better when I wear green. Ooh. <laughs> anyway. Well, when I smile, I, my blue eyes, you know. You there know. you go. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, so 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 you so you only said in the last couple of years though that this character has sort of it, it's it's kind of crept around with you like all the way and then just the last couple of years sort of just the well, humility because, of the humility of the movie and that character kind of hit you. Yeah, well, so what happened in terms of my relationship to Nightmare on Elm Street, the franchise to Amanda to all of it, um, was as I said, I saw the film, the original one. Um, you know, and scared like everybody else. Great movie. Then, then really it never crossed my mind or anything after that. Um, and then, you know, in well, let's figure it out. So if it was 84 and then 89. 89 was Nightmare 5, the highest grossing horror movie of 1989. And there were so many movies that came out that year. When right? I was reading about that, I was like, holy crap. Right, you know, yeah. Batman and Indiana Jones 3, you know, Last Crusade, Lethal Weapon, License right. to Kill, Black Rain, Halloween 5. It's just sort of like, damn. Right, Elm Street 5. Yeah, so we... so yeah, Elm Street 5. <laughs> yeah, so basically, so five years later, right? So I saw the yeah. film, and then five years later, I get, you know, brought in to, to read for the role, get cast, and play this role of Amanda Kruger. And, but that was kind of the end of my acting career because after that as i said you know i was getting offered all these horror films and it was a combination of that of wanting to just break away from that just because i had worked so long to to be able to play such a diverse range of characters yeah that i just didn't want to be niched into one thing it wasn't specifically against horror um as a genre um although it hadn't been my favorite genre but um and mostly as i said because not often not you know, not many horror films really worked on character and story. Um, although I think that's changed a lot, you know, it and I, changed. and I think that's one of the reasons I actually, I really do like Elm street. The more I've learned to, you know, embrace it. I just, it, it does have characters, very strong in characters, but um, so um, I was trying to break out of a relationship and I didn't want to, you know, I just didn't like the way that my career was going at the time. And so I just left it all and I went to Taiwan for a year. And then from there, I ended up in India for two years. 
um, doing volunteer work on a mobile hospital and completely just went into a different place. Yeah. And um, from there, the day that I decided that I was going to devote my life to being uh, a monk and living in India and, and doing volunteer work, my spiritual teacher kicked me out and sent me with a one-way ticket to New York, um, where I ended up meeting my husband and sort of the rest is history. Um, and because I decided to have children so late in life, um, mm -hmm. I uh, decided that at this point, I wouldn't, um, if I was going to, if I was going to have children this late in life, then I'm going to be a full-time mom. I didn't want to. Um... All right. It's great seeing you too, Matt. Thank you, Matt, um, for watching. Yeah. So I, I just didn't want to, um, you know, end up uh, having other people raise my kids. So I just, you know, put everything aside and pretty much, you know, became I worked from mother. home. I became a full-time mother. Um, and the only time Elm Street sort of, um, you know, popped back in was when um, Tommy Hutton contacted me for never sleep again. Um, yeah. So that kind of brought it back up again. And then, you know, and, and that's where I met um, Toy Newkirk. She, she, you know, she was asking me about conventions and why she didn't see me there. And, you know, and I had had no awareness that they even existed. So she was the one that told me about it. And it, at the time, I think Tommy ha set up with his friend, Mike um, Perez, they got the cast of five into two shows. So that was all around that same time. And then after that, I went back to my world as a yoga teacher and parent. And um, it really wasn't until just last year that my, when my kids um, went off to college that I became an empty nester this, just this past summer, that I started to really get back into this and, and, and started spending time on Facebook, getting to know my fans, you know, interacting with my fans and learning how much this had impacted them. Um, and then from there, I ended up getting a new um, rep, Peter, Peter. Drama. Yep. yep. And he's been getting me to a ton of shows. And, um, you know, it's just become more and more my focus. And and that's when it just really started to it, haunt me about it Amanda. Hit, it, hit, it hit you and haunt you. It, it, yeah. that, that's going to be weird. But but what you said something that kind of hit me when you went to Taiwan and India, and I don't want to get too deep into your personal life, but it's like, it's got to be there. Like some of this stuff has just got like, and you've distanced, you've distanced yourself. That's actually very interesting to me. Yeah. From, from my perspective. And it's, and then you don't get that call about never sleep again until 2010. It's almost like it, you can't, it's, it's like Pacino and Godfather three, just when you're out. You get right. Pulled back it pulls in. back in. It right. Pulls me back in. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I think, you know, there, there's lots of people who, Ha stay in an acting career and have children and are very successful in both. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's hard. Um, I, I think wealthy actors can do that pretty well. But, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, an average actor trying to make a living and, um, you know, being able to rush off to auditions and, you know, at a drop of a hat and, and then taking jobs if you're raising kids, I, I, it I gets don't know. lost in translation. There's, there's yeah. something that's got to get sacrificed. And I yeah. applaud you for that. You raised your two children, uh, yeah. two children, you said, right? Yeah. 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 And, you know, and so, you know, it, it just was, it was the decision that I made and, um, you know, I, uh, and I don't regret it for a second, you know, it's absolutely what I needed to do. Um, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, and I also know that I, I was extremely fortunate to be able to, you know, be a full-time mom. I mean, I, you know, thanks to my husband, I mean, not, not everyone can, you know, you can't, yeah. many, many families couldn't afford to do it. I, did we take a huge pay cut? Of course, because it was only one income, but um, I, you know, my yoga teaching, as my husband always says, is more of a charity because <laughs> I don't really make a lot of money off of it, but it's a, it's a labor of love and it's something that I give to my community. I, I love teaching yoga. When was um, your first exposure to yoga at a young age or was it? Yeah, as I was five years old. I was five years old. It was back when we were in Japan. Yeah. And, yeah, we were, my parents would take us to study um, meditation at a Zendo. They were studying Zen meditation um, and we'd go every Saturday. So before we went, she would have a yoga teacher come and work with us a little to prepare our bodies to be able to sit in meditation. So um, I've been practicing yoga on and off and we know that I just turned 60. So 55 years, <laughs> kind See, of a long the, time. That's the one thing I, I've tried. I've tried the meditation thing and I just sometimes cannot get it to come down or level there's always something like whether it's well, work related home related something's always that people, throwing a rock in that pond yeah people 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 i think um 
put too much expectation on themselves when it comes to meditation. You know, yeah, in the Zen tradition, um, especially because we were in a Zendo, you know, you had to sit upright, you know, your head, oh. eyes closed and we would sit for a full hour. And, you know, and imagine a five-year-old kid, but I did. And if, you know, you start to wiggle or move, they'd whack you on the shoulder with a little bamboo thing. But that's, that's pretty intense meditation. Meditation, the second you have the intention that I'm going to meditate, that's meditation. Just sit back wherever you are, focus on your breath, relax the body. And you're not going to ever be able to stop your mind from going all over the place. Thoughts are going to come. They're just going to come. And so, but the but the whole point of meditation is to get to the place where you realize that you are not your thoughts. You can't stop them, but you're not your thoughts. So a simple example would be, you know, if you're really angry and you're just caught up in it, it's like, I'm so angry, you know, and it's hard to not, it's hard to separate from that. Yeah. But if you work with it enough that you realize emotions come and go, they flow through us. We are not, they aren't us. So it's like, I'm experiencing anger right now ex anger is coming through me but i am not and anger i'm not anger and it's a it's subtle but it's powerful because if you get to that point where like you know somebody you know does something dumb and you know this emotion comes up in you but you're like okay all right you just take a breath and you're like okay i'm feeling anger i don't have to react in anger just because it's coming through me so you're not denying the emotion but you're not grabbing onto it and in the same way with meditation one of the things i always tell my students is try to imagine that you're a good one is that you're on a train platform right you're standing there and trains are coming and going coming and going and those are your thoughts they're going this way they're going that way most people 90 percent of people get on the train so that the train takes you the thought just whoo and off you go but if you're in say you're in class you're supposed to be at this lecture you stay on that stand and it, when the thoughts come don't let them take you away they're just there in the background but focus clearly on your teacher and what they're talking and then the thoughts will still be there but your focus is on the class the teacher you're still on the platform you're still on the platform and if you catch yourself on that suddenly somehow before you knew it you're on that train it's this magical train where there's always a platform. You can always get off of it. So as soon as you notice that you've gotten on the train, just step back off of it. And you might have to do that a thousand times while you're sitting there. You keep having to get off of it and stand on the platform. And then you focus on your breath. And, you know, and that's why they, with yoga, we talk about, um, with meditation, you want to have an anchor, whether it's using these malas, you know, so with a mala bead, you're going, you're taking one at a time and you're just repeating a mantra, you know, which could be as simple as peace, peace, oops, sorry, peace, peace. It's kind of like a rosary or your breath, yeah. inhale, exhale, yeah, throughout, inhale. Yeah. you know, and you just focus on something so that whenever your mind gets crazy with thoughts, you pull your focus back to that anchor. So it, but it takes, it's a lifetime practice, you know, as I said, it's very, I started, interesting. It, it's very interesting. I've always been fascinated by it in all honesty. Yeah. So don't, you know, don't beat yourself up. Like, don't say I'm not, I can't do it. I'm not doing it right. You, you are, and just go easy on yourself, but just pull that focus. Just keep pulling away from the thoughts and focus on one thing, but you have to have something, you have to have an anchor, whether it's staring at a candle, repeating a mantra, focusing on the breath, you need to have something to give your mind something to do. It could even just be counting one, two, three, four, one, you know, whatever it is. So yeah. that, so that, you know, it's like, uh, Tom, lunch is ready. You know, all these different thoughts are going, Oh, what, I forgot to do my grocery shopping. Oh, tomorrow I've got this interview. No, one, two, three. And then you go back to the counting, you go back to the counting. And then in a few seconds later, mm, I smell something nice. In I the smell kitchen. garlic. You know, oh, 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 okay. Back to one, two. Mm. And you just have to just train. It's just like any other kind of training. You have to do it over and over and over. I like that. That's pretty yeah. cool. So there you go from Sister Amanda. <laughs> no, Sister Mary Helena. <laughs> Sister. Oh, well, it's been an absolute delight talking to you tonight. It really has. I, I, I appreciate everything that you did with Nightmare 5 and all that. And I just want to shout out to the guys we my cafeteria table and we used to sit there and talk five. It's amazing, like we said in the pregame, how like the first one of a franchise is always your favorite. Right. And that's why I always hold five and one i saw them almost you know i think i saw five first then one because i think when right. my brother was like go watch one okay and i got scared at 10 or 11 however old i was yeah. 
but it's uh what have you got coming up next though you got the book the book is the big I thing the you're working book is on. the big thing we got the fun you know glow in the dark pins we got a few shows that will hopefully be announced soon uh i just i'm not allowed to announce them yet but that um so that's quite a bit going on there. Do you have any crazy? Do you have any crazy convention stories? Everyone's got one. Oh, crazy conventions! Well, uh, most of my crazy convention stories have to do with my crazy rep, Peter. No, just kidding. No. Um. So no, I I do have a few stories, but nothing. I don't think anything that I can really tell. I understand. Yeah, the 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 five crew. We we have a lot of fun. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Like, what's a lot of fun? Like, we talking like fun. no police getting called, no one, you know, no one ends up with the claws coming out of their stomach like that. Well, no claws coming out of the stomach. But the other thing you said, hmm. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like so. scream. <laughs> well, yeah. When you just that that scene was always the the lighting and everything. Isn't that what crazy? Was, I that know. That was crazy. Was that just you going like doing the whole mime kind of? Yeah, that was my one disappointment. I oh god, I don't know. I for some reason after seeing all these so such cool special effects and you know and then the mechanical Freddy and all that, I was so excited. Oh, how are they going to do it? How are they going to do it? And then they stick the thing on my hand and they Hold there the you go. Just... <laughs> and I'm like, oh really? Like, but it was oh still cool with the lighting and the camera kind of going back and then you know you kind of at the just very end. At the very end, I'm. It's a. It's got. It's a dummy. When the doors are closing, closing at the very end, like her twirling back and forth. I don't think, I think. It, it does look like it because you're kind of. It's, it's just, just a mannequin. Of, I think it's just a mannequin at the very end. Just because you kind of, you gave it rock and roll. You were like yeah. going for it. Yeah. The emotion, like a stage actor. And then all of a yeah. sudden it's just kind of. It's like, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. It's like this, right, right, wait. You just see it in the background, like, wait, 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 wait. I, as the doors close, I think they just decided to add that at the end and they didn't want to pay to have me come back. So they just used. Anyway, just like they, they, yeah, they, they used an extra in a couple scenes that people think are me and it's not, but, oh, like who what? was telling me? Oh, you have to watch carefully. I'm not going to tell you. No, obviously nothing when I'm speaking, but some of the non-speaking things are not me. And was, um, was go, going up the stairs was you. Really? Because it almost looked like it, it, the scene with the, uh, that's not you in the scene where you see Robert's human face coming in like that. That's Lisa. Yes. That's not you at yeah. all. And that was one of the big discussion. All. That's one of the big discussions at the cafeteria table was like, yeah. hey, that was her. I'm like, that, that ain't her, dude. No, no. Because and you know, which was a which was an interesting choice because that's, you know, so she was perceiving you know, Alice Amanda's was having eye. to, yeah, Alice was having to experience what that was. Um but yeah, that wasn't me because somebody was asking me in an interview, you know, oh, what was that like, you know, with, with all the, you know, with, with all the maniacs, and I'm like, mm, I don't know, I wasn't in there. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. going up the stairs wasn't you, really? Yeah, it was a stand. What about the shot where where it's Alice meeting you at the base yeah. of the stairs? That was you. Yes. Yeah. And then that close up where, where the camera's kind of like at that angle, and you kind of have like that, like Amanda has that, like she goes up very closely we before you close open the door and then yeah, 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 yeah 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 but um oh who was telling me somebody was telling me um one of the um one of the uh the other franchise come on brain jason was it jason or Friday? Halloween? well they both have one has a map they both have masks but so one of those two franchises an actor is incorrectly on IMBD uh, listed as being that Jason, and it wasn't. Two. Oh, so is that that? It was yeah. part two. Steve mm -hmm. Dash played him in uh, 99% of the movie, and then the, uh, I'll name drop, Warrington Gillette gets credit, but he only did one scene where he came through a window. Oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah that was. That's the, sto that's the story I heard. Okay. Yeah, Peter would be better telling you because I think it's uh, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, no. So sometimes those things happen, and and it, I think it, was it Fangoria, one of the magazines. It pisses me off because I was so excited to be in it, and and it shows a couple shots of me, and then one of them, pretty prominent, is this a stand-in, not, not even an actor, and this it has my name. She doesn't look anything like me. 
I gotta go find this. Really? Yeah. I wonder if it was. Uh... Oi. Let's see. Or do I have? Or maybe was it in this thing? Was it in the? Let me see if it... I thought I had. Because Fangoria has always been the go-to. I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. I... So I do prefer scary monsters because they show a lot of the 1950s movies, which I'm. Oh, look at Freddy feeding my baby. Oops. This was this was a Japanese <laughs> thing. Um, where did I see that? But yeah, it's it's definitely in some magazine, and it's 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 definitely not me. If you look at it, you can tell that it's not me, but it has my name next to it. This is me giving birth. That must have been one hell of a scene. Yeah, that was fun. That was wild. That was with everybody there. That was so dramatic. Oh. <laughs> Brooke. Yep. Yeah. Is it like literally going through an old yearbook sometimes when you when when you go to these conventions and see them and like a high school reunion where it's just like we do. We have so much fun together. I I tell you, I, I was just thinking maybe maybe Peter will put it one together because he's he's fun like that. But um, here I'm gonna see if it's in this one. Peter, uh, wouldn't it be a blast to have just a Nightmare on Elm Street show like with everybody from from a ton of Elm Street. From like, a, like a nightmare convention? Yeah, look at this. That would sell. Bubbly, look at this. This is not me. That's not you at all. No. And it's looks a, like my, it looks like my brother. There you go. <laughs> that was the stand-in, and it has Beatrice Bubbly. It says my name. Wow. Fangoria. Damn. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, when well. you read that, were you like, what the? Come on. Yeah, I was like, come on. Come on. Could you contact anybody on that? Because I've seen a lot of, I've seen a little things like that in the, uh, in the comic book world, things like that. People in, incorrectly getting credit for something that they didn't do. Right, but whatever. You know, what what year was this? Was it when it came out? Do they have dates on them? They should in the bottom right corner of the cover. This one doesn't. Huh. Anyway. I, I'm sure it was like around the time, you know, it was back in the a long 89. time ago, something like that. So, yeah. Anyway, is that funny? I'm his. It is funny. Do we look alike? Like mother, like son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but our eye color is actually fairly similar. Anyway, it's amazing how like that. How with I, I've talked to some people and how just sometimes these projects just stay with you. Yeah. It's amazing. For sure, for sure. For sure. Yep. Anywho, well, alrighty. Just, I appreciate you coming on tonight and chatting with me about Nightmare on Elm Street 5, quarantine, things like that. Maybe we can talk again another night in the future. Sounds great. It'd be great. Uh, where can people find you? Facebook, so people Instagram? Can find me, yeah. So Facebook, Beatrice Bupley, B O E P P L E. Um, and on Instagram is Beatrice Bupley. Elm Street. Um, and oh, and I also just put together a, a YouTube channel. Um, and there's a, a number of clips there. So it's with all the cast from five at conventions. So I tend to do like little I love to do little live um, Facebook feeds when when we're all together, because I know people like to see Lisa and Danny and all that. We're all just joking around. So those are on there. So they're kind of fun. So check out my YouTube channel, Beatrice Bupley, again. Um, or maybe it's even Beatrice Bupley Elm Street. I'm not sure. But, uh, yeah, find me there. Come to my conventions, which I can't announce. <laughs> but as soon as I do announce them, um, come to them. Come see me and ask for me at conventions. And be on the lookout for the book and the fun, cool pin. We're going to have a lot of fun with Amanda. Yes, check out Beatrice Bupley's Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And uh, thank you for everyone who watched Bad for Your Health Entertainment tonight. Don't forget to check out Still Dead Illustrations. They designed the Bad for Your Health Entertainment t-shirt. Don't forget to check out Mr. D.G. Chichester's storymaze.substack.com for all his weekly newsletters. And don't forget to tune in next week for a brand new episode of Bad for Your Health Entertainment. For Beatrice Buffley, I'm Tom Smith. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>